everyone for coming. We'll go ahead and get started. Uh, today, our last Warren seminar of the semester uh, is Professor Eric Johnson from USC. Uh, he has his MS, BS, and PhD from the University of Illinois um, in aerospace engineering. Mm -hmm. Uh, he is the assistant chair currently at the University of Southern California. Um, he is a member of ASCE and on many of the technical committees and liaisons for uh, control committee. Uh, he's also a senior member of AIAA, the Aeronautics Association. Um, he does work in structural dynamics, control, real-time hybrid simulation, and computational mechanics, uh, and or computational dynamics. Um, and he'll be our speaker today talking about controllable damping systems. So please join me in welcoming our speaker. Thank you. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you all for uh, being here. Thank you for uh, inviting me uh, for this uh, lecture series. So what I'm going to talk about today is uh, primarily related to a current project that I have uh, with NSF and collaborating with some people in Japan on some full-scale testing of a structure that will have controllable damping in the isolation layer. Um, so this is collaboration with Rich Christensen from the University of Connecticut. Um, so I, first I'll give a brief advertisement. Uh, I was actually, I, I saw this in my slide and I remembered uh, the Gophers came and played out in, out in uh, Los Angeles against us a couple of years ago and, it, and I think we played here too uh, the year before that. But I, I think neither of them were great showings for either team, but uh, uh, anyway. Uh, USC, as uh, some of you may know, USC is the oldest and largest private research university in the western half of the U.S. Uh, we're older than Stanford by, I think, five years or something like that. Um, we've got about 42,000 students overall. Let's see, which way am I going? Page down? There we go. Uh, so our School of Engineering uh, is uh, smaller than yours by about half. Uh, and smaller undergraduate population, but we have a very large master's program, so we have a lot of graduate students. Uh, and the same thing in our department. We're a little bit smaller than your department, uh, a little bit smaller at the undergraduate level, a little bit bigger at the graduate. So a little bit about us. Um, this thing seems to be, let me try. No. Oh, that one's better. Okay. Uh, so. This is more for the students in the room. Why do we do tests? Why do we do physical tests? Validate models. Are our models perfect? Why, why not? <laughs> I told one of my students just a couple days ago, uh, Everything in engineering is about assumptions, right? It's about simplifying things in some, in some way. Uh, I mean, there are a whole bunch of reasons that we do uh, physical tests. Our theories and not models are never perfect for a whole variety of reasons. Specimens are constructed with engineering tolerances as opposed to what they're actually designed as and modeled as. Material properties are approximate, and this is not meant to be all inclusive, but material properties are only approximate. We neglect many times the nonlinearities. Uh, joints we represent with idealized models. Boundary conditions, uh, those of us more on the structure side tend to want to think of the ground as a rigid boundary condition, which of course it's not, uh, et cetera, et cetera. So there are a whole series of reasons that we do uh, physical tests of various kinds. Um, I'll pose to you the, the suggestion that we need to do tests at multiple scales. Uh, little tests, so this is a little tabletop uh, uh, seismic simulator shake table. Uh, little tests are easy, they're cheap, uh, they're easy to get students engaged in, uh, safer than doing things at large scale. Uh, however, scaling issues can sometimes be in effect. Friction becomes very important at small scales and so forth. Uh, larger scale tests, uh, this is one of my uh, former PhD students here uh, with a little shake table test we were doing at uh, University of Connecticut. Uh, larger scale tests are more realistic and therefore more convincing, uh, but uh, real world tests, full scale tests are, are the most convincing. Uh, 
So this is, I'll talk more about this. This is uh, at the Japanese e-defense facility outside of Kobe. Um, but one of the problems with full-scale tests is they tend to be very expensive. Uh, so the two largest uh, facilities like this in the world are UC San Diego and uh, outside of Kobe in Japan. And to give you an idea, uh, let's just look at this line right here. For each day, you have a specimen op op uh, inhabiting the shake table facility in Japan. Uh, even if the table isn't running, it's somewhere on the order of thirty dollars to $50,000 a day. And each day you run tests, it's about $100,000 a day. And they can only do about five tests per day. Because at this scale, safety is such a big concern that they run a test and then they shut it down for an hour to go in and inspect, make sure there's nothing wrong, make sure everything's working, make sure there's no possible damage that could damage the table or people or whatever. And so a typical experiment in this facility might be on the table and running tests for several weeks plus several, maybe a week or two in advance and a week or two at the end for assembly and deconstruction. So uh, after a month's worth of time, just to occupy and use the table, you're talking about several million dollars. And that's not including the cost of the specimen. It's not including the cost of the salary of the people running it and so forth. So these tests are very, very expensive. So uh, there's a big push at NSF and in other organizations to try to do cyber physical tests where we take information from full scale tests and leverage them with other testing techniques. Uh, and I'll talk a little bit about these uh, more as the, the hour goes on here. Uh, but rooted in what is often called pseudodynamic substructuring testing uh, and real time hybrid testing, these can extend the reach of the large scale experiments with a much smaller cost. Uh, these require that we calibrate numerical models. So take physical uh, measurements off of the structure, try to calibrate numerical models, and then we can do additional <coughs> experiments, uh, either in pure simulation or in uh, mixed cyber physical uh, experiments as well with other kinds of devices. So a uh, little outline of what I'll talk about today. So the, the main topic of this uh, uh, set of experiments in Japan uh, are related to controllable damping, so adding device, and I'll talk more about that in a little bit. Uh, and then I'll talk a little bit about uh, the Japanese e-defense, especially for the students who maybe don't know much about this place, and talk about this experiment that uh, is ongoing. And then I'll talk about uh, real-time hybrid simulation and some of the work that I and some colleagues have been doing in this area uh, for making hybrid simulation more accurate and uh, more amenable to, to more complicated models. So I'll start with the first one here. So what do I mean by controllable damping? What I mean is having some kind of device with controllable properties that we can change in real time to adjust the forces that are exerted within the structure. So some examples. Probably the best known is a variable orifice damper, which little cartoon here, in order for the fluid to flow across from one side or the other to, of this chamber, it has to flow through this bypass. If this bypass is fixed, it's essentially a passive damping device. But if the uh, bypass here has some sort of valve that can be open and closed, of course not by hand, but computer controlled, we can effectively change, even if this is linear, we can change the, uh, the force by changing the effective damping coefficient. Uh, of the device. And the damping coefficient here is basically related to the viscosity of the fluid, uh, temperature, uh, cross -sec uh, ratio of cross-sectional areas of the two chambers, and, and so forth. But bottom line is by opening and closing this valve, we can change those properties. Uh, some of the earliest implementations at large scale of this was uh, Bill Patton at the University of Oklahoma. Uh, this was a highway bridge. In, uh, in Oklahoma, I don't remember which interstate, um, uh, where he installed these to try to reduce the fatigue damage of the, of the bridge uh, due to large trucks going across. Uh, similar uh, effects can be gained using controllable friction elements, where instead of changing some valve, if we change some normal force, we can change the force that it takes to move these two ends of this device across. Uh, and then starting somewhere in the 90s, uh, 
uh, electro-rheological fluid dampers and magnetorheological fluid dampers were studied uh, that eliminate a mechanical valve and instead of a mechanical valve use an electromagnet, electromagnet to change the properties of these fluids in real time. So they change from something like a heavy motor oil into something like a semi-solid um, and thereby change the force that's required to move this piston back and forth. So the easiest these to, to, to think about is the variable orifice, as I mentioned. So a variable orifice damper or a passive damper with some small damping coefficient, if we look at a force as a function of velocity, it has a relatively shallow and flat curve. If it's a very high damping coefficient, we get a curve that looks something like that, and of course, anything in between. The advantage of a controllable device is that by opening and closing the valve, at any particular velocity, I can exert an entire range of forces as opposed to one particular fixed force. There we go. Another way to think of this is from, a, from an information point of view. A passive device knows nothing but local information. Uh, so a passive viscous damper only knows the velocity across it. It doesn't know what, what's going on in the rest of the structure. In contrast, a controllable damper where we can change its properties and change the forces, we can use feedback models. We can have sensors embedded throughout the structure, accelerometers, strain gauges, et cetera, uh, to determine what's going on in the rest of the structure and then try to command the damping force based upon global information. Um, good analogy is old style car brakes versus anti-lock brakes. For the students, do you know what that means? Have you ever driven a car that doesn't have anti-lock brakes? Especially in a Minnesota winter. Okay, so for those of you who don't know, so uh, most vehicles today have anti-lock brakes, where when you push on the pedal, there's a computer between you and the, and the brakes, right? In older style brakes, when you push the brake, it was, a, it was mechanically pushing on some disc, for example. Uh, and the brake thinks it's doing well when the tire stops moving. But we all know when there's black ice on the road, the tire stopping to move doesn't mean the car is not moving, right? When I was 16, I put my, put my parents' car into a ditch and exactly, I, mean, I'm, I grew up in Chicago, so same kind of weather. Uh, my, my wheels were stopped, but my car went right off into the ditch. Current uh, uh, and starting probably somewhere in the 90s, anti-lock brakes became common, and so between your foot and the brakes is a computer control that when the tires start to stop, it can monitor the different tires on the car, and if one tire is stopped but the others aren't, it knows that the car is still moving, and it changes what it does, and it pumps the brake on and off and on and off, so it never actually locks up. So it's using global information. It's using more than just the local information of that tire to determine the best course of action. So why are these useful in, in base isolation? Uh, US design code mandates that the superstructure remain elastic in relatively large design earthquakes for base isolated buildings. Uh, the isolators need to accommodate a very large drift across them, which makes the isolators expensive. It makes the connections between the ground and the building expensive because they all have to be flexible. All the electrical, plumbing, et cetera, sewer, they all have to have flexible connections so that they can move across that isolation layer. And so there are ways that are needed to uh, uh, reduce the drift across the isolation without increasing the superstructure deformation and do this in a cost-effective manner. And there are some uh, interesting newer uh, advances in isolation technology like the triple friction pendulum devices that uh, are trying to do this in a passive way uh, that uh, can have effectiveness in some cases. But controllable dampers, uh, I'll make the case, uh, have, have some capabilities here too. So uh, this is going back to some work that I did with uh, Bill Spencer a few years ago uh, to help motivate this. We looked at uh, uh, base isolated structure. This is based upon a model from Jim Kelly at uh, Berkeley. Um, where we looked at a conventional lead rubber bearing isolation and compared it to the fixed base structure and compared it to a similar structure that has a controllable damping device in the isolation layer. Uh, 
And we looked at uh, several studies. We looked at the letter rubber bearing, which is a typical base isolation uh, approach uh, for two different levels of earthquakes that I'll explain in a second, and compared it with controllable damper and with passive viscous linear dampers. And I'm not going to talk about the last of those in the interest of time here. Uh, looking at a number of different historical earthquakes, we also did some synthetic earthquake records as well, uh, and scaling these to different magnitudes to understand how uh, these effects, uh, especially since both of these systems end up being nonlinear uh, at different levels of excitation, what happens uh, differently. So uh, the best or the optimal uh, passive conventional design, letter of a bearing design, <laughs> turns out to depend upon the earthquake. Uh, and this is not only can we show this uh, in simulation, uh, but this is also in uh, uh, recommendations in a number of standard uh, design textbooks for uh, uh, isolated systems. So I'm going to do, this is a little study of that, that uh, five-story uh, isolated building. We looked at the drift across the isolation layer and the accelerations in the superstructure. Uh, and it turns out the accelerations in the superstructure are highly correlated with the drifts in the superstructure for isolated buildings as well. So we'll just use acceleration as a proxy for superstructure deformation. Uh, one of the prime parameters in lead rubber bearing design for isolated systems is the yield force of the lead. So it's the force at which the lead starts to shear uh, in, in a virtually plastic manner. Um, uh, and uh, another parameter that runs around in this is the pre-yield to post-yield stiffness ratio. So how stiff is it before it starts to yield? And what we see typically, and this is, this is true for many earthquakes, and I'm showing it here for, for two different earthquakes of very different characteristics, uh, the base drift tends to be small when we make the yield force large. In other words, when you make the uh, isolator more rigid, you get less motion across the base. Well, part of that is duh, of course, right? But when we make the isolation more rigid, we're making it more like a fixed base structure and sending more energy into the, into the superstructure and causing larger deformations in the superstructure. So there's this contrary trade-off that the accelerations and the drifts in the superstructure also go up as we uh, increase the, the uh, yield force. So we've got these sort of competing objectives. We want the motion across the isolation layer to be small, but we want the deformation and motion in the superstructure to also be small, and these turn out to be opposite and conflicting constraints. So the uh, design guidelines, uh, so well-known book by uh, Skinner uh, and company, uh, suggests a, uh, for a moderate earthquake, like the El Centro earthquake, suggests a relatively low yield force. We don't sacrifice much in the way of the drifts across the isolation, and we keep the acceleration and the superstructure motion relatively small. The problem is, is if we use that same design over here in the stronger Kobe earthquake, and as I said, this applies to, to other earthquakes as well, uh, the drifts are much larger than what we would like them to be requires larger isolators, more expensive, and so forth. On the other hand, if we design, as is recommended, uh, using a much stiffer or stronger isolation so that the drifts are small in the big earthquake, then in the small earthquake, we get small drifts over here, but we get accelerations and superstructure motion that is much larger than it needs to be. And that has implications on uh, non-structural components, damage to non-structural components, damage to contents of the buildings, occupant, occupant discomfort and uh, injury and so forth. So what, what we really want is we want a system that acts like this lead rubber bearing design in the small earthquake, but acts like this lead rubber bearing design in the big earthquake. And that's obviously over, overly simplified, but it, it, it I think, uh, communicates the, the, the need for uh, adaptability. So let's look at what a controllable damper can do in this case. Uh, and I'm going to normalize everything by the lead rubber bearing design designed for the uh, smaller earthquake or moderate earthquake. And this is going to be a somewhat busy plot, but I, uh, hopefully I can explain it here. So we're going to look at, at uh, the base drift and the structural motion, superstructure motion. And again, the accelerations and the drifts are relatively correlated here. And all of them are normalized by the one lead rubber bearing design. 
and we're going to look at, again at these four earthquakes, and we're going to scale them to different uh, levels, different uh, peak ground accelerations. And what we see for the lead rubber bearing design, uh, well, let me, so this, for example, is the El Centro earthquake scaled. Here's the, the one times El Centro, half, one and a half, and two. And what we see is if we use the stronger lead rubber bearing design, we get reductions in the base drift, but we get fairly large increases in the superstructure motion. Basically, what we're doing is making the structure more fixed base, which kind of defeats the purpose of using the isolation. Uh, in a really big earthquake, it, it works fine. We get uh, drift reduction, we get uh, acceleration reduction, but in everything else, all the more frequent earthquakes, we get much larger motion in the superstructure than is necessary. In contrast, a uh, controllable device, so this was a controllable MR damper, uh, we're able to get reductions in drift and no increases, and in some cases, some decrease in the motion in the superstructure. So because this controllable damper has adaptability, it can act like a different passive system in each different uh, earthquake scenario. So that's basically what I just said. Passive designs are fixed. Controllable devices can adapt. OK, so uh, switching gears a little bit to uh, uh, this work going on at eDefense. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, eDefense is, uh, is the nickname. The official name is Hyogo Earthquake Engineering Research Center. It's run by the Japanese National Research Institute for Earth Science and Dis Disaster Prevention. Uh, the uh, expense of this uh, was, was uh, justified after the 1995 Kobe earthquake. Uh, the damage estimates, if I remember correctly, were somewhere on the order of 150 to 200 billion dollars. Uh, just immediate damage, not to mention the larger scale uh, effects on the Japanese economy. And so to, to take 1% of that and put a billion dollars into building a facility like this uh, was felt justified. Uh, so this uh, place started operation around the year uh, 2002 or so. It's the largest shake table in the world, uh, 50 foot by 65 foot uh, shake table. Uh, it can accommodate a building of up to about 1,200 tons. Uh, and so we're talking about full scale buildings. We're not talking about models. Right. It's kind of insane, isn't it? Um, and oh, and the, uh, what I don't have on my slide, oh, I did it, okay. It's also, it's full six-dimensional motion. So X, Y, Z, roll, pitch, and yaw. I think I got them right. Um, whereas, so the largest facility like this in, in the U.S. is about half the shake table size is, is at UC San Diego, but it's one-dimensional. It can only shake in one, one direction. Uh, so this is really a unique facility. Uh, so they, they commissioned uh, a, a study of base a base isolated system. They've tested a number of base isolated systems, but one particular uh, that I've been involved with, uh, and this is the specimen under construction uh, a few years ago, uh, is one to test eventually controllable dampers in the isolation layer. Uh, in the meantime, they're also doing some tests on uh, the effects of very long period earthquakes on isolated systems, which is not, uh, there's some concern, especially with the Tohoku earthquake having significant energy up in the three, four second period range. Many uh, isolated buildings have their fundamental periods for large scale motion up in that area, and so that's, that's a big concern. Uh, especially for those kinds of earthquakes, what happens if the, if the isolation pounds up against the moat wall around the structure? Uh, and then in the end to uh, test some controllable damping strategies. All right. Well, okay. Uh, so this is a little uh, uh, cartoon schematic of the, the structure. It's a four-story reinforced concrete moment frame. Uh, it's uh, got some strong shear walls over on these sides. So the motion, uh, even if uh, the table's moving one direction, we get significant torsional coupling uh, into the structure uh, since it's asymmetric. Uh, it weighs about 700 tons. Uh, it's designed according to official Japanese design code, and its linear isolation uh, period is, is a little less than two seconds, uh, but up to about four seconds as uh, the motion gets large. 
so in the isolation layer, uh, there are a number of components uh, looking down from above. Uh, so this was tangent for a second. One of the pictures you probably saw the building hanging. So they build the specimen outside. They have some big uh, truck, basically, that lifts the whole thing up and carries it into the building. And then they've got a set of large cranes to pick the building up and set it down onto the shake table. Um, so this was before they put the building down, the, the picture looking down. So this has uh, rubber bearings at two corners. It has elastic sliding bearings at the other two corners. It's got some oil dampers to add additional damping uh, and energy dissipation. And those are the ones that will be replaced with controllable dampers in the next set of tests, as well as some steel dampers to help uh, uh, inelastically uh, provide energy dissipation. Uh, one of the things I found amusing when I uh, first uh, went to this facility is they, they make every uh, specimen like it was a real building and try to do something different for each room. So this was set up as a neonatal in, in, uh, intensive care unit. Another room was set up as a, uh, as a uh, museum. Uh, they, we'll see in a little bit another room that's set up like an office building. Um, and well, I mean, like things that happen here in the US. I mean, this is Boku bucks paid for by the Japanese government to do these tests. And they want to make sure that the public are aware of what's going on and try and teach the public something about what can happen during earthquakes. And one way to do that is to make these things look like uh, our homes or office, offices or apartments or whatever. So uh, tests that I helped with in 2013 in August, uh, we tested a number of different earthquake records, particularly uh, one from the Tohoku earthquake, uh, the GR Takatori record from the Kobe earthquake, and some synthetic records uh, that are reflective of the types of ground motion that would happen in the Osaka region. And then we had some limited tests with these dampers in uh, controllable mode, but uh, uh, most of that's getting pushed off to the next series of tests. So to give you an idea of what's happening here, this is a... Uh, me holding my camera, taking a picture or a, a video of the monitors that they have monitoring everything going on. Oops, there we go. Now, let me comment here. This is the isolated building. If this was not the, an isolated building, uh, everything in this office would, be, would have been on the ground from about 10 seconds in. Uh, and the babies here, which are still, were still kind of floating around in their mobile beds, uh, would have been tossed over and everything. So the isolation did work well, but obviously not quite as well as we'd hope, right? Um, these tests were specifically looking at, at pounding against the moat wall. So every isolation, uh, isolated building, the isolation is usually below ground level. And so it's excavated out so you have a concrete moat wall around it that there's some limited gap that if the building moves too much, it's going to pound. And especially in these large uh, motions, there's concerns about what kind of, what that effects of that impact can be on the superstructure, on the contents of the building, and so forth. So here's an example. This is, uh, there will be pounding right there where I've got it circled. And I think this was one of the Tohoku records. So it, you can see there was a little bit of a pounding there. It didn't look like it was very significant, did it? Well, let's look at the moat wall. So you can't see scale here, but that's, that's a 50 centimeter heavily reinforced concrete wall. And I was close enough to see this when it happened. And that wall just went boop. I mean, it, 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 it looked like it was on just a hinge at the bottom. It looked like there was nothing holding it up uh, from that, uh, that impact. Uh, and I don't have a video here, but uh, it also you could see the impact of some of that impulse up into the superstructure as well and the contents of the superstructure. So as I said, I've got a current grant uh, with Rich Christensen to take, to take part in some additional experiments that were originally planned for this spring and various government budget issues have pushed it back, pushed it back to next year, and it might get pushed back to 2017. We don't know yet. Uh, but in the meantime, what we're trying to do is develop some numerical models of this 
structure based upon the data that was collected uh, during these experiments. Um, so how are we doing that? Well, we've got design drawings. Notice the language? So all the drawings are in Japanese, which has been interesting. So I have my, my Egyptian PhD student is trying to translate Japanese uh, design drawings. That's been, that's been interesting. Anyway, um, so we've got drawings of the superstructure, detailing, connections, uh, drawings of the, uh, the isolation devices, and so forth, and translating all that into finite element models. So we've got this in an open seas model, and as well as a, a SAP 2000 model uh, with beam and shell elements primarily, uh, and about 10,000 degrees of freedom in the model. So, and that's what the first few modes look like. Uh, this mode is mostly translational in this direction. These start to induce some torsional uh, lateral coupling and so forth. Um, now the problem, of course, is that things are never built exactly the way they're designed. And even if they are, when we do the modeling, we have to make assumptions on material properties and so forth. So uh, we've got some differences. The, some of the, the fundamental frequencies of the superstructure are off by about 20% right now, which is pretty significant. Uh, and so we're in the process of using some of the data that we have from the structure. So I've got 40 gigabytes of data uh, from the tests. Uh, this structure has about 600 sensors on it, uh, about 40 or 50 accelerometers, about 150 strain gauges, et cetera, et cetera. And we're using that sensor data to try to calibrate these numerical models now. Uh, and so that's in sort of an ongoing project that is... Uh, uh, it turned out to be much more difficult than we thought. So that's there we go. I was about to say, okay, I guess the seminar is done. <laughs> okay, so uh, hybrid simulation. Uh, so the intent of where we're going to go with this is once we build these these numerical models, we can do a number of things. We can do the control design parameter studies that are necessary in advance of the tests that we'll do with the controllable damping uh, at E-Defense uh, next year or the year after. And because these, ex these experiments are so expensive, we can't afford to go try something and then go back to the drawing board, try something, go back to the drawing board. We've got to have all our ducks in a row in advance. And uh, then afterwards to try to do some hybrid simulation. So hybrid simulation grows out of uh, the field that's sometimes called pseudodynamic testing. Um, it was first proposed by some Japanese researchers in the uh, 60s and 70s. Uh, I'll skip over that. Maybe. Okay, we're done. <laughs> okay, so... Uh, the idea of pseudodynamic testing is that we, we, uh, if we have a component from an analytical model and the force that it exerts, we replace those with a physical test. So instead of having a purely computational test, if we have some component in a structure, a column, a beam, uh, a brace, uh, we have a computer model that uh, simulates most of the system, but then we have some information about what's happening locally at that element, spit that out and have it uh, exerted in a physical test and then measure the forces that are being exerted by that element and feed it back into the numerical model. Uh, actuator dynamics, control dynamics can't be neglected. So uh, uh, some guys at Michigan uh, back in the 80s uh, started looking at what if we include the, those dynamics into the problem. Um, the numerical model for these generally uses some uh, time integration from the Newmark family, uh, and they're generally performed, the pseudodynamic tests are generally performed somewhere on the order of a hundredth of real time, uh, so that damping and inertial effects are negligible and they don't need to be taken into account, which uh, I'll come back to in a second. So basically, as I said, we're breaking the structure into components that are physically tested. So if this is the full structure, we're going to replace that with a component that models this little brace here, this little knee, plus a numerical model of the rest of the structure, and then tie those together as we showed in the previous slide. Problem is, is what about what if dynamics are important? 
what if rate dependence is important? So it, there's some evidence that uh, concrete structures, that rate, rate dependence is important. Certainly for damping devices, which are very dependent on velocity, are dependent on the rate. Uh, sometimes we can approximate these. Uh, if the device is relatively uh, well characterized, uh, but otherwise we have to do these tests in real time. Uh, similarly, inertial effects uh, need to be taken into account. Sometimes we can approximate this by lumping physical mass into the numerical model, uh, but there's always uh, some error in doing that. So, uh, some challenges. One of the main challenges in real-time hybrid simulation is whatever numerical model you have, all of the computation to simulate its behavior over the next time step must be done during a physical time step because you've got a physical component. You can't say, okay, wait, stop. I need to do some more computation. It has to happen in real time. Uh, so what that means is simple models, simple beam stick models, are relatively easy to do in this, in this real-time framework. But any kind of high-fidelity model, that we would often develop uh, based upon, uh, uh, you know, uh, derived from our finite element models, derived from design drawings and so forth, are often of order that are much, much more complex than can be accommodated. And there are a number of ways to approximate that truncated modal representation, Ritz basis vectors and other, and other approaches. Uh, but, and, and for linear systems, those can work reasonably well. If you have any nonlinearities in the system, you really don't know uh, in advance when you can truncate, uh, at what point you can truncate modal representations, for example. Uh, actuator dynamics are particularly important in real-time hybrid simulation. Uh, effectively, you have a control loop, uh, and if you do the wrong thing, if there are errors, delays, and so forth, uh, they can in induce effectively negative damping in the system, which can make the system go unstable. Uh, and I'm not going to try and talk about that uh, aspect of things today. Oops. So a typical real-time hybrid simulation, we have some, some excitation that comes into a structure model. We get some local responses around the specimen that we're interested in uh, out of the structure model. Feed that into a controller and a servo hydraulic actuator to enforce some motion on the physical specimen. And then we measure the force out of that specimen and feed it back into our structure model. Okay? That structure model could be standard linear MCK structural dynamical model. It can be a state-space linear model. It can be some nonlinear model of the structure and so forth. For, uh, for now, for the arguments here, let's just, let's just assume it's a linear model. Bottom line, as I said, the computer must do all of these computations uh, within a single discrete time step in order to keep up with the physical experiment. Oh, come on. And this becomes intractable, as I mentioned. Most of the real-time hybrid tests that have been done uh, uh, use models that have at most a couple hundred degrees of freedom and generally much, much lower order than that. So uh, me and a couple of colleagues have developed some approaches for looking at how we can speed this, up, speed this computation up when we have systems that are mostly linear uh, and localized nonlinear behaviors. Uh, and so I'm going to throw a few equations at you uh, in this slide. But, um, so let's assume that the specimen force depends on some local responses R. So what I mean by that, for example, if the specimen happened to be a simple passive linear viscous damper, well, the force of that specimen depends upon the velocity across the device. If it was just a linear stiffness element, some beam or column, uh, then it depends upon the displacement across the device. And obviously other devices would be more complicated, uh, but these responses are some measure of displacements and velocities within the structure. So if this specimen force time history was known a priori, if we knew it in advance, then the response of this system can be broken up by superposition and solving two separate equations. We can solve for the response of the structure without the specimen to the external excitation. Uh, and based upon that, we can define something that's like R, uh, but based only upon uh, the structure without the specimen. And this part of this contribution to the local response 
doesn't depend on the specimen force. And so it could be pre-computed in advance of our simulations. Um, so this S, for example, R, R, I said, for a passive linear viscous damper, R is the velocity across the damper in the real system where the damping coefficient's not zero. S is the same system, but assuming that the damper doesn't exist. Uh, let's see, and Z here then is the response of the structure without the specimen to the specimen force alone. And then we can do a little bit of uh, uh, playing around mathematically here, and we can write this response as a convolution uh, using the impulse response of the system and this uh, force. And this is, of course, all assuming that we know the force in advance, which we don't yet. And the result then is that we can write this specimen force, again, through some math, as the nominal force, if the specimen wasn't there, plus some other convolution integral. Uh, the convolution here has to be computed in real time, but this impulse response function can be computed beforehand offline. And so essentially what we're doing here is we're taking some of the computations that real-time hybrid simulation normally does during real time, and we're moving some of them to a pre-processing stage. Okay, uh, I'll come back to that in a second. Uh, so this is the fast real-time hybrid simulation. So we've got this convolution that's computing the, the uh, specimen response. We add it to the pre-computed local responses, feed this into a controller, servo hydraulic actuator, enforce the motion on the specimen, measure the force again, and then send that into this convolution integral and solve. And then after the fact, we can do a different convolution, add in some nominal motion, and we get the global response of the system. Uh, the key importance here is that the number of calculations during the real-time part of this becomes independent of the number of degrees of freedom of the system or the order of the system. Uh, and it depends only on the number of elements, either physical elements or simulated nonlinear elements, and on the uh, number of time steps in the simulation. And so we don't do any real-time integration of the, the equations of motion. Uh, so we're replacing this conventional real-time hybrid simulation with offline pre-processing. So we compute nominal global responses and local responses in advance. And then uh, these impulse responses we compute beforehand. Then during the real-time computation, we've only got this low-order loop where the, the order of all of these things is just related to the number of devices we have. So it becomes a much low-order problem that can be computed very, very fast. And then we do some offline post-processing to compute the global responses. So like I said, basically we're taking most of the computation and pushing it outside of the part that has to be done in real time. So and then we've got uh, how do you implement this convolution integral, what well, turns out to be not too difficult to do uh, if you're using MATLAB Simulink for uh, the, uh, the real-time testing algorithm. Uh, there's a block in MATLAB that can be sort of coerced into doing this. Uh, we've done some tests, first with a low-order uh, system. This is a paper that uh, Rich Christensen, Steve Wykiewicz, and I and a, and a student did a couple years ago, uh, where we had just a two-degree of freedom frame and compared a purely numerical simulation with uh, a standard hybrid simulation approach with this convolution-based, uh, convolution integral-based approach, and we get uh, very good uh, uh, comparison of the results. Uh, Rich Christensen went on to do this with a much more complicated model, uh, a uh, 263,000 degree freedom model, finite element model of a uh, highway bridge in uh, Connecticut uh, with a uh, truck test, so simulating a truck coming across the, the numerical model, but where he tied it with, a phys with two physical MR dampers being tested in the laboratory at Lehigh. So these are the physical devices, damping devices, that are being simulated to being added to the bridge to affect a reduction in the response of the bridge. And a uh, little cartoon from Rich uh, that shows results uh, of what happens in these tests. And so you, get, you can get the full accuracy of the finite element model, but tied it, tying it in with these physical devices. There we go.
some things that we're doing is uh, the, uh, the integration scheme that we're doing using so far is uh, uh, only first order, and so we've got a second order integration scheme that we're de we've developed. Uh, and in simulation, it provides uh, a reduction of about 80% in our preliminary simulations on the error. But we haven't done any physical tests of this yet, and that's uh, uh, going to be done hopefully this summer to make sure that that works as expected. So some con concluding remarks then uh, that I'll leave you with. Controllable damping uh, can provide improved performance, uh, in particular for these isolated structures, but other types of structures as well, uh, because they can adapt they can use global information, not just local information. Uh, this E-Defense experiment is the first full-scale testing of controllable damping and base isolation. There have been some small-scale tests that have been done in, in laboratories and a number of researchers that have done around the world, but nothing at full scale. Uh, there is a building in Japan at Keio University, if I remember correctly, that has, a, has uh, controllable dampers in the isolation layer but it's never been tested, uh, and it hasn't undergone any significant earthquake to know if it will perform well or not. So uh, this is the first set of tests that will do that. Um, as I said, I think real-time hybrid simulation is needed to leverage, especially at the very large scale, these very expensive physical tests. Uh, and then finally, uh, doing some work in, in hybrid simulation to replace the uh, conventional approach for doing the simulation with something that can speed up uh, the integration scheme significantly so we can include much more high fidelity models in, in the real time system. Uh, some collaborators, Rich Christensen at the University of Connecticut, Steve Wykiewicz, uh, who was here, is now at Clarkson, Bill Spencer at Illinois, Thomas Abramson at Chalmers Uni Institute of Technology in Sweden. Postdoc, some students, uh, and I can't leave out uh, some Japanese collaborators, uh, Eiji Sato, Tomohiro Sasaki, and Taichiro Okazaki uh, contributed to this too. And of course, thanks to NSF for uh, allowing us to get this stuff done. So thank you for your attention. I'd be glad to take any questions. As you mentioned, there are these competing uh, criteria. On the one hand, you don't want to have the base move too far. On the other hand, you don't want to have acceleration too high at the top of the building. Right. So your controllers kind of weigh of those two in some way? So uh, again, the way I would, I would, yes. So the specific control strategies I used here tried to keep at minimum both the accelerations and drifts in the superstructure as well as keeping the, the uh, motion at the base small. Now, that's sort of the way it's defined, but it's, it's misleading because at any point in time during the earthquake, one or the other might be larger than, than, than the other. And so really what it does is it's, it's sometimes trying to reduce the response in the superstructure when the superstructure response is large, and other times it's reducing the motion across the isolation layer when that motion starts getting larger. So it's... it's Sort of going back and forth and adapting, if that if that makes sense. Yeah. yeah. But so I imagine that the, this measure can be done in a variety of different ways. Yes. Oh yeah, yeah. Certainly, certainly. Yes, yes. Uh, I mean, once once you have some kind of feedback control in the loop, then it's all a question of what is your what are your objectives? What do you want to try and minimize? What do you want to try to control? Yeah. So in in some other some other problems, I mean, you can envision a. Uh, I don't know, some semiconductor factory where you might not care so much about the accelerations of the structure, but you might care about uh, sensitive equipment and what the impact is on that sensitive equipment. So you could actually try to control the motion of that sensitive equipment so it, it wasn't damaged. Yeah. Thought I, no? You convinced yeah. me the big, big experiments are expensive. <laughs> um, I've seen a number of people talking about that shake table in, in terms of in this venue, et cetera. Mm -hmm. But always people talk about running the big experiment and then calibrating the model. Yeah. That seems backwards to me. Um, why doesn't anybody ever talk about the models they built beforehand yes. and why their model didn't work? Mm -hmm. Because I would actually 
I think perhaps the most important thing would be improving our ability to model, not always calibrating after the fact. Yeah. I, th I think you're entirely right. I, one of the limitations here is that this is the Japanese government's experiment. And so I'm a little bit limited on, uh, well, I had limited access beforehand to what models they were developing. And so wh what I have is design drawings and measurements after the fact. And even, <laughs> even those, the, the experiments that they ran, they had some specific purposes of, uh, for those experiments, the pounding, the response in the Tohoku earthquake, and so, and, and, and so forth. And those are not necessarily the experiments I would run if I wanted to best calibrate my models. You know what I mean? It's, it's the excitations that they used, the, uh, the number of tests that they ran, et cetera, the bandwidth that they used on their random excitations were not tailored necessarily to do the modeling. So I, I'm wholeheartedly in agreement. But, you know, it, if I, if I had about $5 million to, to run one of these tests myself and use their facility, which they would be, they would be glad to take my $5 million, uh, then we could do it exactly the way it should be. But, you know, as an aside, I, 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 anecdotal comment, I, I talked about the uh, uh, d devices in the isolation layer here. One of the devices that was in there is this U-shaped damper that sits something like this to dissipate energy. That was the one thing I was not allowed to take pictures of. And I thought, I, I finally asked them, what, what's the reason? Why can't I take a picture of this? And then they said, well, you can take a picture of it before it's used, but not after. I thought, well, well, it's, you know. But I saw some of the ones afterwards. Instead of a nice symmetric U-shaped, these things were mangled like someone had tied them in knots and then untied them. Turns out the manufacturer is concerned that even though the whole point of those things is to dissipate energy, so I mean they're like a fuse, they work when they break. They were concerned that the public perception might be that if they see pictures of these things all mangled, the public would say, wow, your device didn't work at all, it's broken. Anyway, I thought that was... A, a, that's one of those things. It's, it was a non-engineering decision, but uh, you know, public perception. Oh, just, <laughs> it's kind of an related question, but I, I happen to be in in Santiago right after the yeah. uh, yes, the yeah. great <laughs> earthquake. And I was shocked how little damage. Not the 1961 No, no it one. was uh, <laughs> three years ago. Yeah, but, yeah. but basically, there was very little damage there. What, what do they do to uh, protect their business? And do they use this type of system? So uh, there are some base isolated systems there, but not very many, um, at least to my knowledge. I, I am by no means an expert on, on Chile and, and the effects of that earthquake, so I, I'm... I'll speculate, but I'm, I, you know, big caveat here, right? Um, first of all, I mean, so there was damage uh, in certain areas and to certain types of structures that were strongly affected. Uh, but also, uh, if I remember correctly, the epicenter was not right there in Santiago either, was it? Uh, I mean, it was not too far away, but uh, I, I think that the damage could have been much worse. I mean, we saw what can happen even at a distance or distant earthquake this past week, right? Uh, depending on the construction. Uh, so I, I'm not going to, I can't really speculate on. Well, I, I happened to build them next year, and when they have the mild earthquake, it was quite powerful. I, yeah. I could feel it, although I was on the third floor. Yeah. So it's, it's, it's a rough area. To live in. But somehow they, they managed to do a good job. The only thing I know, they didn't adopt ACI code, and they're very proud of this. <laughs> they're very proud of it? Yeah. yeah because otherwise, the, 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 the only, only bridge which, which collapsed during that earthquake mm -hmm. was a bridge which was built using European Union design by a Spanish company. <laughs> <laughs> so as an aside, I, I, I got woken up yesterday by an earthquake in Los Angeles. So little one, 3.7, but it was... Uh, 
epicenter was just uh, four or five miles from my house. So it was small enough that actually I, I, what I thought it was, I thought it was one of my kids doing this on the bed. Uh, and I opened my eyes looking around for them or my wife, and no one was there. And I thought, what was, was that an earthquake? Anyway. I have a small question. Sure. Um, for the real-time hybrid simulation, uh, wh how would that work if you have a more nonlinear structure? So would you have to test most of those nonlinear elements? In a physical Physically? Way? No. Okay. So uh, exactly what I, what I showed here for the physical specimen, if you have localized places where there's nonlinearities, you can simulate in the same way. So instead of, uh, I don't know if I can go back and find it here real easy. Yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> no, it's okay. That would be a lot better than me standing here trying to push the buttons and looking down more than I'm looking out. Um, so this same uh, online loop where we have some physical specimen, if we have additional, additional locations where there are nonlinear elements in the structure, we could have a parallel loop like this for each of those nonlinear elements. Now, if there are nonlinearities occurring everywhere. If there's plastic hinges showing up in, in almost every joint of the structure, for example, then this will be no faster than a conventional approach, probably. I mean, we haven't tested that. But, uh, but if the number of places where you have a physical specimen or a nonlinear element, if the number of those is small relative to the overall number of degrees of freedom of the system, then this will work fine. It's a little bit more complicated. Actually, what happens is instead of for a single specimen or device, uh, this impulse response ends up being usually a scalar function or at most a two by one vector function. Uh, if this is, say, five different specimens or five nonlinearities, this ends up being a five by five matrix. And so it scales, the complexity of the computation here scales with the square of the number of nonlinear elements or specimens. So at some point, the computation would grow larger than what the original conventional hybrid simulation would do. Yeah. Okay, well, let's thank our speaker. Thank you all. Oh, yeah.